The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur magazines. Did you ever wonder how John Singer Sargent painted, how he got all that beautiful brushwork? Did he paint fast or slow? Well, I've always wondered that, and so is Thomas Jefferson Kitts. In fact, he has spent his life studying Sargent techniques, studying his paintings, reading everything that can be read, and he's going to teach you what he believes is how to interpret Sargent in your paintings. Enjoy. John Singer Sargent was born in 1856 in Florence, Italy, to American parents who were living and traveling widely as expatriates in, in Europe. They had had the means to join the many affluent Americans who were then broadening their cultural experiences on the continent. John and his two sisters born after him accompanied his parents wherever they went, and mother, an avid watercolorist, took it upon herself to educate the children as they traveled. Originally, John was expected to follow his father's steps into the Navy, but by the time he was an adolescent, his precocious talent for drawing and painting led them to enroll him into a Parisian atelier instead, where he would benefit from a more formal training in art. Sargent was 18 years old at the time. They chose the atelier of Carlos Duran, run by a Spanish painter who had achieved considerable standing and success in Parisian high society, even though his teaching methods and philosophy were radically different from most of the other French schools in the city. Carlos Duran had his students start by drawing and painting simultaneously which may have led Sargent to his lifelong interest in painting in the most direct way possible, with little to no preparatory drawing or sketching underneath. After leaving his teacher's studio, Sargent continued with his travels, visiting European museums and studying masterworks from previous centuries, notably by such painters as Diego Velazquez, Franz Hall, Peter Paul Rubens, and El Greco, all who became lifelong influences on his work. Sargent's itinerant lifestyle became an ongoing source of inspiration and during his lifetime he produced over 900 oil paintings and more than 2,000 watercolors as well as uncountable sketches and charcoal drawings. His body of work includes subjects from all over the world from Venice to the Alps to Corfu the Middle East, Montana, Maine, and Florida. Domestically, Sargent spent most of his life in Paris and London, living with close family members and friends. He excelled at the grand portraiture of the Edwardian age, with later trips to Boston to complete and install large mural commissions, while also painting celebrated members of the New York and Boston Society. Sargent had enjoyed early acclaim as a portrait painter in Paris, but in 1884 his submission to the Grand Salon of Madame X 
supposedly a modern portrayal of the new Parisian woman, resulted in a scandal that ended his career in France. As a result, Sargent departed for England, where he soon launched another successful career as a portrait painter. From early on, Sargent demonstrated a remarkable ability to draw with a brush, which inspired admiration as well as later accusations of superficiality. His grand portraiture was consistent with the demands and expectations of the landed gentry, while his more intimate studies of family and friends and informal landscapes incorporated many of the fundamental concerns of French Impressionism. It also anticipated certain aspects of mid-century modernism. Later in life, Sargent stopped accepting portrait commissions entirely and devoted his time to producing public murals in Boston and painting en plein air during his seasonal travels, both in oils and in watercolor. Following his death in 1925, critics and art historians devalued his remarkable achievements until late in the 20th century when he and his accomplishments were finally restored. Hello, my name is Thomas Jefferson Kitts, and it's my honor and privilege to present a demonstration on Sargent's working methods. Uh, but before I begin, I would like to just share a, a, a story about how I met Sargent metaphorically. I was a poor undergrad student in 1983 at the Kansas City Art Institute, and I had to go over to the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art to do a paper on some artist who I don't remember. And on my way back, I stopped at the gift shop and I was looking at all the fabulous books that they had on artists and I saw something I'd never seen before and that was this book, this book on Sargent, which was published about that time and well, it was the very first monograph that ever came out on him ever, Rizzoli Press. Uh, I, I flipped it open and I was blown away by what I saw. In that moment, I understood what I wanted to do. I wanted to paint like this guy. I didn't have any idea how to do it, and truthfully, nobody else did either, but I spent the next 30 years of my life chasing after Sargent. This book changed my life. Having said that, let's move on and talk about some of the uh, materials and, and uh, tools that Sargent was using. But before we begin, I'd like to share a few art terms that I'm gonna use throughout this demo that uh, will help explain what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and, well, just make things a little more clear. The terms are shape and surface planes, value, meaning light and dark, color, meaning hue and chroma, lost and found edges, thick and thin, opaque and transparent. I will add more terms as I paint, but these will be the principal words I use to explain what I am doing during this demo. All of these terms have to do with the quality of the paint and the value relationships that he's establishing. One of the interesting things about Sargent is that he was a rarity so far as painters go, meaning he, he didn't change his processes or his materials all that much. In terms of his palette of colors, as established by the Tate in England and the Harvard uh, Fog Museum, he painted with lead white, ivory black, neutral gray, burnt sienna, raw sienna, burnt umber, raw umber, red lead, Verona brown, vermilion, rose matter in two different shades, lemon yellow, chrome yellow, chrome orange, Indian yellow, artificial gamboge, terre verte, transparent oxide green, emerald and viridian green, ultramarine blue, Prussian blue, cerulean blue, and indigo. So what I want to run through here is the 
overall palette that I'm going to use throughout the demo, but then I'm going to take it away and just show you what I'll use in the actual sort of initial wash in. Uh, the paints that I have here, again, they don't exactly match what Sargent was using because many of them we don't have available today or we shouldn't be using. And also some of the paint has been made in such a way to make it sort of act differently than say the paint he would have had access to, just the way it physically pushes around. But in general this is as close as I can get and I think it's uh, easy for you to find. So let's go over the palette that I'm going to be using for this demo, which is similar but not exactly the same as Sargent's because, well, in some cases, some of the pigments are no longer available because of safety issues, toxicity and whatnot, and other reasons that they're just fugitive or they just fade over time. Let's start with, we're going to be using a, a lead flake white. We're going to be using ivory black. In Sargent's case, he used a neutral gray, which I will mix on the fly using the first two. And then uh, we're going to use cad yellow lemon, cad yellow medium, cad orange, this is naphthol red, which is the substitute for genuine Chinese vermilion. This is a quinacridone red, which is the substitute for the two uh, um, rose matter shades, which are very fugitive, so it's a kind of a cool red. Then we have a cobalt violet, which I'm going to come back to. We have an ultramarine blue, Prussian blue, cerulean blue, and viridian. Before I go to the earth colors, let's talk about the violet. Sargent wasn't really known for painting with a violet. Many of the impressionists that he knew in France used violet, but he tended to mix his using ultramarine blue and rose matter. Um, since I'm not going to use rose matter, I'm going to use a very weak kind of violet. If I were to mix my ultramarine blue with the quinacridone red, I would end up with a very strong, very, very powerful violet, and I don't want to have to fight that because I know that what Sargent was mixing wasn't that strong of a violet. By substituting this cobalt violet in, uh, it gives me an immediate violet that can be pushed towards red or pushed towards blue, but it's weak. It, it mixes very nicely, and it would have mixed very much like rose matter and ultramarine blue would mix in his day instead of using some contemporary violets, which are very strong. Moving over to the earth colors, Sargent used Indian yellow, he used ochre, he used raw sienna, he used burnt sienna, he used raw umber, and he used burnt umber, and he used something called Tierre Verte, which is an earth-based, uh, very weak green-brown. And that pretty much covers the paint that he was using. So let's talk about what mediums Sargent was painting with. I always thought growing up that he painted with just turpentine, real turpentine, and uh, oil. And that's what everyone thought as well, but some recent studies done on his paint films at the Tate in England shows that mastic, which is a varnish, uh, shows up in a lot of his paintings, in fact almost all of them. So it also turns out that he was using uh, what's called a bodied oil or a heat bodied oil. So the medium I'm going to use is something I have avoided for most of my life because, well, I didn't know that's what he was using. But it's actually based on Merger's medium. It's also known as McGilp. And if you talk to conservators about that, it's kind of a, it's an issue with some of them. They, they're concerned that if you paint with this particular medium, your paintings will, well, they'll darken or they'll crack or they'll just prematurely age. And that's why I stayed away from the medium. It's a beautiful medium, it's wonderful to paint with, but while I was again doing the research on Sargent, I kept asking myself, how could he be using this medium and why is his painting still holding up? So for the purpose of this demonstration, we're gonna use something that's a modern counterpart. Modern in the sense that it's still the old ingredients. This is not a manufactured mastic uh, medium. This is actually the real deal, but it's done with using modern tools, modern chemistry, better materials, with the hope that in the future it's not going to change. We'll see. All I know is that when I was doing my testing and working out how the paint moved around, I suddenly realized, wow, this is how you get some of these painterly effects that Sargent was producing. So I mentioned Marigé's medium 
and or McGilp with some reservation, and you will see me use it here. Uh, another thing to be aware of is that it does have lead boiled into the oil. You, you make this by boiling a lead salt into the linseed oil, which turns it into something that's commonly referred to as black oil, just because it's darker, not because it turns black. And then that's mixed in equal parts, 50-50-ish, uh, between mastic and turpentine and this black oil. And it turns into a gel, and that's what you're going to see me work with. And we'll talk about that in detail as I'm painting, because that gel imparts a very, very cool thixotropic quality to the paint, which again, I'm going to talk about as you see me paint, that, well, the people who use it, they love it, and I can see why. The other things that we're going to use, we're going to use a little bit of oil, and in this case, a little bit of odorless mineral spirits. Now, Sargent would not have odorless mineral spirits. Mineral spirits which is a less refined form of odorless mineral spirits, was invented in 1928. And well, um, it was invented for the dry cleaning industry, but it obviously it became quickly adopted by painters because it was an inexpensive, easy to get kind of thinner or solvent to use in your paints. Sargent would not have used this. He would have been using rectified turpentine, real turpentine. And the stuff he would have used would have been as I said, rectified, it would have come from a particular tree and from the root ball of that tree so that it had a certain property to its thing that we don't get in odorless mineral spirits. One of them is that the turpentine would flash off and evaporate very rapidly within minutes, whereas odorless mineral spirits can actually take 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes for it to finally evaporate out of your paint on your canvas. There's no way around that, by the way. But for this demonstration, because almost all of us are really working with OMS now, odorless mineral spirits, um, I'm going to use it here, but not much. Most of my moving around of the paint is going to come from the medium, or it's going to come from the addition of this oil. And this is just cold-pressed uh, linseed oil, which would have been very in keeping with the oil that a Sergeant was using at his time. So now, we've talked about the paint. We've talked about the solvent, and we've talked about the actual medium, paint medium, that I'm going to be using. Let's talk about both the canvas and the brushes that we understand Sargent was using. Most of what we know is coming from uh, sort of analysis at the Tate in England from their conservation department. They did some recent studies, which I found very fascinating. One of the most surprising things about Sargent in the research that I did had to do with his brushes. I had always thought that he'd been painting with filberts, some soft and maybe some hard, but largely filbert brushes, sometimes fairly long to get those calligraphic strokes. But in fact, analysis at the Tate had shown that he used a very limited range of sizes of brushes and a particular, basically one kind of brush. Most of his paintings were executed with a what's, what's considered a flat, meaning it's got a squared off end, and it's a little longer than it is wide. And the size ranged from quarter inch across the ferrule, which would be the metal part, to about three quarters, which is not a lot of difference. Even his larger paintings seem to show brush marks at about that size. Now, if he needed to, say, soften an area, or if he needed to kind of throw down a larger shape, you can look at his work and you can see how he'd lay paint down and then he would wipe it off with a rag. Um, and that would be one of the ways he would build up these smooth transitions and keep the area transparent. So when you see me paint this painting, I'm going to use essentially these brushes here and not much more. Uh, the exception to this is that apparently when he would lay in his painting, what I'll be doing next, is he might use a round. Now, they called it riggers back then, but we call it a round now. And that's probably about the size that he was working with. And that's just for the purposes of getting some sort of lay-in quickly. Um, but after I do that, this will go away. And it may never come out again. There's a few other brushes that I might use for sort of small touches. But I won't be painting with them. I'll be laying down little highlights or little dots and things. So from brushes, we move to the canvas, the 
the support, the painting support that uh, Sargent preferred. And again, I found this very interesting because I thought he kind of just used whatever he could get whenever he was traveling or whether he was in Paris or when he was in London or when he was in Boston. Fact of the matter is, he was pretty picky about his painting supports and it's generally understood that he had a support custom made for him. Um, he didn't necessarily buy his brushes or his paints or make his uh, canvases. He had all that stuff done for him by his assistants or by uh, you know commercial color men. And yet he had a particular thing he liked. When it came to the canvas, what he wanted to paint on was a very fine linen that was very heavily sized with rabbit skin glue, which is unusual because usually you want to use the least amount of rabbit skin glue underneath your gesso on top of your linen. And the reason why is rabbit skin glue is fairly hydroscopic. It expands and it contracts with the humidity and temperature changes in the environment that it's hung in. But for some reason, he really liked having like thick rabbit skin gesso in between his canvas or his linen and the actual gesso that he would be painting on. And the only reason I can come up with is that it probably filled the weaves more quickly than thinner coats. Because what he liked on top of his rabbit skin gesso was a thin, thin coat of lead ground, meaning basically it's a lead white ground. So he painted on an oil ground that was very thin on top of a thick rabbit skin gesso. Uh, and again, I think the reason might be because he didn't like to have a lot of his oil sinking in so the rabbit skin gesso protected the linen underneath, but he wanted to have a, just a little bit of the lead ground on top of the rabbit skin gesso. And what I've done here is, again, this is contemporary version. I didn't make this. This is a commercial canvas. It can be readily found, but it is an oil ground. It's very thin, and it's also a fine weave. What it doesn't have is that thick rabbit skin uh, glue. So after my experimentations over the past couple months, I think this was a pretty good compromise uh, to get the effects that we're going to look for in this demo. I have done something else to this canvas. Time and time and time again, when I was looking at uh, Sargent's original work, you could see certain transparent passages or even unpainted areas of a canvas, and it kept coming back as sort of an off-white. And then I also read that he liked to paint on an off-white. So this canvas has been prepared with a wash of lead flake white and a little bit of ivory black to kind of give it a slight off gray. And I think you can just see from the, the demo that it's not white. If I were to hold a white up to it, you'd see how much of a shift there is between white and this neutral gray ground. This is important because having just a little off white allows you to kind of pull the values and pull the colors together more quickly. And when it came to painting quickly, that's what Sargent was interested in, in the most direct, immediate way to get to his effect possible. Before we begin, I'd like to offer an apology to Sargent, um, an apology based on the fact that Sargent was a plein air painter. He painted outside under natural light. Uh, he painted from live models. And I'm doing neither. The irony is not lost on the fact that I'm in a darkroom studio painting a Sargent-esque kind of thing from a monitor. You know, that's not lost on me because I prefer to work from life outdoors and from real people as well. But given the constraints of having to photograph this in a way that makes sense and also just at a high level of production, we took it indoors. So just so you know, I know that you know I'm inside. So one of the things that everyone comments on with regards to Sargent is how um, fluid and spontaneous his paintings look. And we have to be cautious of that because while he did draw directly in as he started to paint, he didn't necessarily lay down a drawing on his canvas and then fill it in with color. In fact, it's rare that you ever see anything 
that indicates anything of the sort or drawings or any sort of underwork. Uh, he did a lot of prep work going in, meaning he would do a lot of sketches. You know, if you look at uh, Madame X, there were many pencil sketches and paintings and tests and watercolors and things like that that kind of prepared him for the final painting. And that's pretty true for a lot of his major works. And I took that path here myself, which was to work out some of the problems I anticipated having using charcoal. And these are meant just to be a little sort of, uh, I don't know, they're just meant to be uh, problem solvers, as I said, so that I know what I'm getting into as I go in. Um, and they're not meant to be anything more than that. And there's a few more behind me on the wall. But I will refer to these drawings, actually, when I get to the faces, hands, and feet. I'll look at my references, but I'll also look at these drawings because I've, I've figured out how to do things with these drawings that I don't necessarily know in the photos, references. That being said, we're going to do a little sketching in, but it's a very light and unfixed sort of sketching, meaning that I'm not trying to put down a developed grisaille and add color on top because that's exactly the opposite of what Sargent would have done. I'm just going to use the drawing that I do to situate uh, where the figure is going to be within the rectangle, where the big shapes are going to be, where's the area of focus, that kind of thing. If I get a good start, that means I'll move along much quicker and I'll sort of avoid certain traps or pitfalls that I can fall into if I have a bad start. When you look at Sargent's paintings, he didn't start paintings the same way every time. So there's some latitude here in what I'm about to do. But I want to talk to you about how I learned to lay in sort of or situate the uh, composition and how I learned to start a painting and how I think he might have done it more often than not. There's a couple things. He would have used a fairly neutral value-based uh, lay-in. It wouldn't have a strong color at that point. He would have been interested in sort of where are the mid-tone values uh, first because generally he worked from the mid-value range out to the bottom and to the top end, the lights, um, almost always. Uh, and that's what we're going to do here. So what I'm going to use is a mixture of uh, just basically burnt umber and the lead white and some of this medium that I've been talking about. And we'll just push it around and, and get it close. So. Sergeant said, put enough paint down so that you could push it around. Um, interesting things happen when you actually put thick paint down. Having said that, that's not what I want to be doing right here, right now. I want to keep things thin. I don't even want to uh, necessarily uh, go to my full darkest darks or my lightest lights. I want to kind of hold back on committing to that kind of uh, value d uh, development because as I paint this demonstration, I'm going to continuously be correcting and modifying the uh, drawing. Um, there will be no point where I'm done drawing as I paint this. All right, now this is the gel medium. And as I said, it's a mixture of mastic, lethargic, that lead and oil mixed together. And it's made to a certain consistency with turpentine, which is flashing off. If you decide to paint with this, be aware that you want to have some ventilation because there is real turpentine here coming into the atmosphere. Um, oh, brushes, brushes, brushes. Let's just start with something sort of middle size. This is, that's the size we're going to use for our lay-in. So for the duration of this demo, I will be working from a monitor, which you'll see in some of the shots. So you can see you know, how big it is. You can see how it relates to my uh, setup with my easel. Ideally, I would have an even bigger monitor than this, because if I can get things to a one-to-one -one reference size, then that's great. That's really easy. But this is really good. And you may note that this is a vertical painting, and we turned the monitor vertical for that reason, so that I could get the image up as big as possible, which, which is also nice, is that I can actually, since it is a photo, we can um, take it up in size. Oop. And so when I need to, I can zoom in or scroll around. 
Uh, but most of the time, I'm going to have it set to as big as it can for the whole image inside of my um, crop. And the reason is that I want to be able to see how big the figure should be in relationship to the canvas. Uh, the other thing you may or may not be able to see is that I've got some crosshairs that divide the canvas up and give me a little simple grid. It's basically cut in half vertically and then cut in quarters horizontally and that's just to give me some reference points to be able to quickly, quickly, quickly lay in proportions on the figures. We don't see that happen uh, in Sargent's paintings. Uh, he doesn't grid things out and transfer drawings in this sort of old classical way. He just dives right in with full confidence and verb. I just need to do this because we're only going to do in a couple days what he might actually try to do in, I don't know, four or five weeks. So what I'm going to do here is loosen up the paint a little bit and I'm going to lay it in. Not so much grid lines, but just tick marks which tell me where the halfway points and the quarter points are, and then I'll use that as my reference. So I'm just going to say, oop, there's the bottom, there's the top that's roughly halfway between the left and the right. And then I'm going to go here. That's about 50% or halfway. Maybe, maybe it's a little low, but it's close enough here. So now I've quartered the canvas, and since I'm actually using a vertical quartering system. I'll just tick mark this like that. And again, this is not what you see in Sargent's work. This is just for me to expedite and move quickly. So now when I look at my reference, which has the crosshairs in that configuration, I can tell that, well, you know, Lulu Bells, and that's her stage name for this, she chose it, that her hat is right about there. And then I can go, okay, that means Adelaide, which is actually her real name, who's friends with Lulu Bell, go about here. If this is the halfway point, that tells me I'm a little too small. Now I'm trying not to outline here. That's the one thing I want to avoid doing, is outlining. I want to sort of indicate the figures in the shapes without creating a cartoon or some sort of uh, line that goes around the figure and closes it off because eventually I want to uh, keep it, well I just want to keep it open and if I keep it open the idea is that I'll be more open to changing and correcting like I can already see. You'll also see me hold my brush differently during the painting. So now I can see already where I'm placing the head on Adelaide is a bit of an issue. And that's because I'm looking at the space between this here and where her hat is. Her head is, and hat is a little lower. So Lulabelle is here. She turns in her little pinafore. By the way, these this is Edwardian clothing um, that is actually uh, antiques from the period. This would have been the kind of clothing that he, Sargent, would have been using and painting, and people would have worn all the time. And this is meant to be more of a, less of a, like it's not meant to be a formal portrait, it's just meant to be sort of an informal moment between, you know, a, a niece and an aunt, or two cousins, something caught quickly. Um, not something that's, so the, the clothing that I selected for this reflects that. And again, I want to make sure I avoid outlining too much. Now, again, what I'm doing here is I'm looking at various pieces. I'm not just looking, let's say, at Adelaide's head. I'm looking at the space between Adelaide's head and Lulu Bell's arm, the negative shape as well, to kind of develop a proper sense of scale. And it will look kind of messy for a while. That's okay. It's oil paint. I get to uh, screw it up and wipe it off and scrape back. 
and sort of move it closer to what should be there. Now, let's see, here's her shoulder, puts her hand somewhere out here. It's a little higher, somewhere like in there. Now there's a tree here, which is kind of cool. I love this old apple tree. This, this uh, orchard is an old pioneer museum of apple trees and pear trees near my home, where these are specimens that were collected around the state and grafted onto trees here. And somehow that just seemed appropriate. Okay, so now I'm going to, I'm leaning back so that I can kind of get a further away. I can start to make smaller adjustments, let's say. I'm looking, okay, wow, I'm going to have to really move this head. We haven't even gotten to where I'm painting yet. Um, so here's that center point there. So that puts her face right more in there. So we're going to be looking at the negative shape a lot, a lot right here. Now, a fluid line is better than a, you know, I tend to, to, to draw in sort of straight lines, which is not necessarily what JSS, that's what I'm going to call him from here on out, uh, John Singer Sargent might do. Uh, it's just kind of the way I, I learned to draw. That's better. That's better. I would like to say it shouldn't be or doesn't have to be exact, but he was a very literal painter in the sense that he wanted to uh, get the feeling that it was real as opposed to heavily interpreted. He would exaggerate, let's say, um, certain characteristics, but he wanted you to feel like that's the way it really, really was when you painted it. In fact, he was kind of accused of being a little too literal towards the end of his life. Um, some people might say unfairly. So let's see, we're going to kind of wipe this back and kind of come back in. And you can see again, I'm just looking for the bigger shapes. Now I am using the corner of the brush. I'm not necessarily using the flat. I'm using the corner. It gives me a more expressive quality to the brushwork. And I think that that's critical to getting a sense of free-flowing, sergeant -y kind of things, is don't just hold that brush flat. Now, as you see, I'm just simply mixing in some of the lead white, thinning it down with some of this, uh, this uh, medium and some of that uh, OMS. I haven't used the oil and probably won't till quite a while. Uh, let's see, now I'm checking landmarks and I can see right away I have got an issue here. So I might have been closer. So let's see, her hat. I might want to make that a little more exaggerated. Again, being careful not to outline too much. There's something nice about how Adelaide is setting her hips here, holding up the basket of apples. And let's bring in where is her Lulabelle's termination of that beautiful pinafore dress that she's got. Now, one thing I do want to talk about with regards to Sargent and drawing the figures that he quite often exaggerated the length, much as you see models today when you see photos of them wearing highly fashion. You know, their legs from the hips down have been accentuated by the way the camera lens was, was used. Um, I've done a little bit of this. I'm not going to do as much as, say, he might, because it's not really a, I don't like to go quite that uh, exaggerated with, say, the length of, of, uh, of, of the figure. But I do want to sort of pay homage to that. This would be, say, the foot in that area. 
Now there is more space between this, so that's that negative thing. So I'm gonna go with that for now. And what I mean is that there's more space between the two dresses. And we'll see how that looks. Now, one of the things that you aren't gonna see until late in the game here is that um, there's gonna be, this is an apple tree. And I'm gonna be putting a lot of apples up, up here, sort of hanging down. So that's why you see me setting the figures so low. Normally, if this was just more of a straightforward portrait, I'd raise the figures so the heads were further up in this area here. But I want to allow room for the, the design and the pattern that's going to develop of the apples hanging on the trees, of the apple that is in uh, Lulu Bell's hand, and even apples on the ground. Just sort of like use the apples as a way to kind of move your eye around and through the image. This is something I do see a lot in Sargent's informal work, is he's always looking for some sort of repetition in form and shape and design, uh, to, to put it simply. Okay, so let's see. Now, poor Lulu Bell forgot her 19th century shoes, so she volunteered to do stand in this tree in bare feet, which when I saw that, I said, oh, girl, that's awesome. We gotta do that. But she put up with some discomfort to do that. She's a strong gal in that way. Now, you can see everything's weighted over here already if you're paying attention. Um, and I need to think about how I'm going to counter that so it doesn't look like the composition is sort of leaning or tipping to the left. And one of the saving graces I've got is I'm actually going to bring Adelaide out a little more this way. She has a bustle on, believe it or not. It's, a, it's again, it's Edwardian, so it's not quite like a Elizabethan, but she is wearing a bustle under there, so it brings it back. And this tree here is in the crop, meant to kind of pull the eye back in towards the center. And you can take liberties with the shapes that are outside of the figure um, to, to do that. And you can see I'm not worried about indicating too much about the trees or leaves. This is just so I can see how things sit. Do I have the shoulders? Do I have the hips? Do I have the hands close to where they need to be? This is a particular kind of basket. It's a 19th century basket. Believe it or not, it's called a buttocks basket. And it's going to look like a, a butt. Um, I, I thought about changing that to be honest, because uh, I thought some people might just have trouble with that. But I'm going to start with it being very historically accurate. And it has to do with this construction. And of course, that's why they call it what they call it. Let's see now. Going to be approximate, approximate with the, with the uh, fingers and hands, because at this point, we're just blocking in. And the idea here is to kind of just quickly get a sense of placement, scale, and size. The next step would be is to actually start blocking in maybe some lights and darks. And I'm going to go back and forth between blocking in shapes, which would be the shadow pattern, and erasing by wiping out as needed. OK, we're going to actually take that. I want to take that over more just because it's kind of a nice turn. I hope you're not seeing me uh, outlining, because I really work hard not to do that. And when I teach, I try to get people to stop doing that when they're drawing or painting, so that they feel like they have the freedom to go outside the lines that they've just created, let's say. All right, so I'm just checking my position of things. Let's take that down there a little bit more. What's nice about this mastic medium is it has a nice pull and drag. No, I don't really want that, not yet. In fact, I'm gonna put this away because I don't want that. I want to have a surface that grabs the paint and doesn't get too slippery. And adding oil at this point would possibly make it slippery. Now, none of these shapes are the value that 
we'll have at the end. You know, the, the shadow that's cast by the basket here is much darker in the end. But I, if I keep my light, if I keep my darks lighter, then I'm more likely to make changes to the shapes as I need. I learned this when I was drawing in school. Not to go in heavy and hard from the start. I think, was it uh, Michelangelo that said that I just chisel away all the things that doesn't look like the sculptor, sculpture? That's in one respect what I'm doing here. I'm trying to just sort of take away or put in just enough to get the point across at this stage. Okay. Now it's funny, we'll get to light and dark shadow in this area at some point, but I just want to kind of see how things go. Now there'll be areas in here where you don't see a definite contour or definite edge. And that's good. You can take that and exploit them. Like right in here in Lulu Bell's pinafore, you don't really see when it starts and stops in the shadows. And when the hat um, starts and stops entirely clear. Now she's looking down, so that means her hat, the radius, is going to be in perspective downward. And Adelaide is looking sort of up and across, which means you see underneath her hat. And that's really an important, important element to this. Uh, the, the fact that those brims tell us so much about the direction of the, uh, of the uh, heads. I'm going to bring this down lower. And you can, see, you know, y y you know, at some point you learn to sort of ignore earlier things, let's say, uh, that you drew. You know, you don't have to get rid of all your miscalculations. You can just draw past them, so to speak. So right in here, I'm thinking, oh yeah, okay. So. There's more distance between her hand and her shoulder, meaning more distance this way. This would be a pretty good example of the tree is somewhere in here, hand somewhere in there, like that. And what I want to avoid again doing is, just like I don't want to line up and create outlines of everything. I, I want to uh, avoid blocking up my darks too much. Okay. Now that actually should be further over because we want the tree to support her. I don't want this tree to be too lined up with this side. Sargent actually did change quite a bit in his paintings for compositional effects. There are times where he would paint, let's say, a, a mountain or the, the tumbling stones coming off the mountainside, but the stones that were in the foreground weren't what he wanted. So he actually would turn and look at another set of stones and move them back in to compose with. And I'm going to do a little bit of that here. A little bit. That's, that's the sort of thing that, as the painting evolves, I start to do. Okay, we're going to bring this over. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of using a plumb line. This tells me where the vertical is. It tells me if the hip is in far enough against the shoulder or is the neck or the spine, you know, at the right angle, let's say. It is said that Sargent never drew without a plumb line, literally a, a line with a weight at the end. Whenever he drew the figure, he would hold that, and that would tell him very subtle shifts 
in the balance or whether or not the bicep was in front of the elbow or not. Um, it's actually a very handy thing to have handy. I guess I left mine in my suitcase. So this is, this relationship still a little, ah, I think that's what the problem is. I think we're going to end up pushing up. That's actually lower. I made that a little too low. So let's go with that being her hat, a little larger. That's not the actual side of the hat. That's just where it disappears into the overlap of the, of the uh, apple blossoms that brings her shoulder down. And her shoulder actually is right here. So again, the nice thing about this medium is that it just allows you to paint over so readily. Now, Sargent was a shape-based painter, meaning he went after shapes. He didn't render hatch very much. He's, he's looking like for this. He's looking for that shape. against these shapes. And we will do the same. All right, I'm going to speed up here. When I don't talk, I can paint much faster. So I'm going to try to speed up and talk a little bit less. OK, so here we go for a little while. That's a problem there that we'll work on. Oh, I'm going to take these off because I think I can see much more quickly. Mostly because I'm getting to an age where it's harder to see things close. And I'm having to look close. Now this would be the dappled light falling across the uh, pinafore. And again, I'm just adjusting it at this point. I'm also going to change it. When I did a full-size comp of this, I decided that it was better that the actual shadow of this came lower to underneath the basket, to bring out the basket. And now, I'm not going to try to paint individual bits of shadow yet. I just want to paint the block, let's say of the shadow, and then I will come back and start to develop that a little more subtly. So we have this light basket against this dark, which I do, do like. We have this camouflage crane where the shadow is coming over her arm, which can confuse the eye. And then we have the shadow where her shoulder is taking her into the shrubbery. Now there's also shadow here on Adelaide's um, shirt. I don't want to get too lost in that yet because it's small stuff. There's a cast shadow here. And now here's a decision I have to make, which is, <clears throat> which is, Let's see how these shapes work. We have to sort of look at the shadow cast here by the basket and the shadow that's being cast in dappled light. And where, they, where do they sort of merge in terms of value? Where do they sort of create a, a larger super shape? And initially that might look like it's flattening things. It does for now, but I'll come back in and after we get the middle values 
established. Remember, sergeant work from middle values out. Once we have the middle values and the middle shapes established, then we will start to distinguish uh, what's near, what's far. And we're going to get a little bit into, and this is just to allude to, I don't want to get caught up in trying to paint this all out. We're going to allude to some dark foliage. And what I'm looking for here is dark against light light against dark. So I can see how the blocks, the shapes, the planes work. How one dark might tell me about the light and how one light might tell me about a dark. Key here is to really quickly not get caught up and two small shapes too early. Okay, there's that hand. Let's see, did I put too much space there? I don't know, we'll find out. Okay, I am squinting a lot, even with my glasses off, I'm squinting a lot. Let's make this a little thinner. And let's do the vertical again. Yeah, that's not bad. So here's the foot, and here's the other foot. For now. What's interesting is that this is all kind of in shadow, meaning close to sort of the same darks. And that's how I am going to depict it. Now this and this are not the same. It's interesting, this shadow back, back behind that tree is actually a little lower than what's over here. It may be changed, let me change that to be closer than that to each other. We'll see compositionally how it develops. Okay, and This sort of a, a drop or a fade as we go down there. When this goes a little darker, as it goes into a sort of soft shadow, that'll bring out the more edges, the lighter contrast against the darker darks. Uh, that'll pull your eye upwards. All right, so now I'm gonna lay down some very thin washes and they're just meant to kind of start to separate larger masses, meaning, I want the area of focus. What I want you to enjoy is this area of the painting here. The backlight behind the trees, that'll be a secondary element, but I really want this to be the story. And by putting some of that there, you can start to now see the Adelaide and Lulubel are becoming more present, for lack of a better term. Okay, so now it's almost enough of a lay in here, but I'm going to slow down a little bit again and take a look at proportions because boy, now's a good time to fix any real glaring errors. Um, it's more like that, and then what I'm trying to do is find the mass of the leaves and the trees against the figure. I don't want to sit there and invest much time in um, drawing them out. I just want to sort of get a sense of that this is lighter or darker. Some of you might want to put more. Some of you might want to put less time into this stage. Um, it changes for me, as I imagine probably did for Soroya. 
uh, depending on the circumstances and the time I had, have to get something down. So do what you can do in the time you have. And one thing I love about this medium is that once you put it down, you can continue to push it around, and it does this drop in the sense that the pigment sort of stops moving. It doesn't slump. It doesn't sort of melt. It stays right where you put it, but it allows you to come back even hours later and do the same thing as if you just laid it down, which is my idea of a, a dream painting media. Now, her face, uh, um, Lulabelle's face, is in shadow, and I chose it for this reason, because it's a tough thing to paint, but it's also one of the sort of charming aspects is that her face is in shadow, whereas Adelaide's face is in light, and there was something about that duality that I liked. Nothing sinister, of course, but it's just there was something about that yin and yang thing that seemed really cool. And those are the contrasts that I really try to um, emphasize in my own work because that's the sort of thing I saw Sargent emphasizing in his work. And again, I'm going to say it again, you know, I admire Sargent. I am no Sargent, but I try to learn what I can from Sargent, um, which is as much as possible. Now, you can see I'm getting a little denser a little denser with the paint and I will probably end up scraping a fair amount of this off towards the end of the day so that uh, I start with a thin surface again. That's something that is sort of unspoken about Sargent is how often he scraped his paintings, certainly his portraitures. Uh, he really liked to come back to a simple underlayment and build up his colors again and work it and work it and work it and finally in that last sort of session lay down thick paint that you, you see we see when we look at his paintings it's almost as if the last thing the, the first thing you see is the last thing he put down I guess that's like stating the obvious but there you have it so let's take this down a little more Okay, now, here's a difficulty thing. This, this dress that she's wearing, the skirt, this Edwardian skirt, is a heavy gray wool. And its local color is dark. So I want to give a sense of the mass of that local color. But I also want to make sure that it feels like there's light involved. I don't want to lose all of that. And the same is true with the uh, tree, which as we develop, the tree is kind of a dark gray that goes into a shadow shape. That's too much of a line, and let's do that. So again, I know we're flipping back and forth, so you can see the painting and you can see the image I'm using, the reference, which, uh, you know, was shot by myself and a friend for this purpose. Um, so you can see how I'm trying to indicate what's actually going on with the light and shadow, but I don't want to be too tied to it. Not yet, and maybe never. Now we see that the sort of area of focus is sort of now moving into the middle part of this rectangle, which is what I want. I don't want them dead center, I want them a little bit off center, but I want them in the center so that your eye just naturally gravitates to it because this painting is going to be about what happens in here. I am going to introduce now, uh, in, in a sense, a sort of complementary complementary uh, hue. In this case, it's an ultramarine blue, and I say complementary because it's, it's a bluish color that's set off of a really dark orange. If you think of raw sienna, I mean, a burnt sienna, it's really kind of like a, a, a dark, dark, dark valued orange, low chroma. But the point here is that this is a classic, classical uh, mix to get darks that can be either warmer or cooler. And so much of what Sargent 
does in his blocking in has to do with warm and cool. Warm lights, warm darks, cool lights, warm darks. And now by adding this, I can start to kind of redraw in and get a sense of what changes, what needs to change. And I can also start to think in terms of shifts in value. So I can also take time to correct. Again, correcting is always good on the fly. So I want to bring her over a little more. And you note that I went from a big pole, fat wide pole, to a thin pole because it has to do with how I view this part of her sleeve with the uh, leaves behind. Let's take a look at uh, Lulu Bell here. Again, being cautious not to get too persnickety with line work. Now, I'm just simply looking to correct and set up for where the hand is going to be. I'll do some overpainting, you know, clearly. Actually, I'm going to put my glasses back on now. Okay, yeah. Because I'm starting to look at small, small issues. Now, this is a, just meant to tell me where the basket is. That's the other side of the palm, the thumb, which is a little far over. Let's, let's take, move this sh over. Now, I want to lean back while I'm making these changes. Uh, because if I don't, I can get too, too uh, persnickety and I can also stop seeing the whole painting together, which would not be good. I want to be able to see as much of that painting as I possibly can. Now, let's indicate Lulu Bell's uh, ponytails braids because they tell us so much about the fall line just like the hats tell us about the position of the heads the way her ponytails drape tells us a lot a lot about how her spine is and the angle that she is at okay now let's see now I don't want to get into drawing faces and hands yet that's that's premature Thin this down. There's a shadow, kind of massy thing happening here. And this has to be just treated very thin, almost like a watercolor wash. It's, I think it's one of the reasons why he liked working on a fine weave, was that he could get everything from a very small texture from washes to building up you know, um, thicker texture, which we'll be doing towards the end of the painting to play off texture. You know, a shorter path to here is simply just go dark in value, take it to the middle values, and then we'll come back in and punch out the sky holes. And then we'll add thicker paint for lights and darks. Let's go ahead and go bigger for this area. So we've gone from that brush to this brush. And the only reason is that I want to be able to move quicker. It is said that uh, Sargent painted with slow haste, although I remember it being deliberate haste, meaning control but fast. And that's what I'm recommending we do here.
Okay. Now what I don't want to get into is painting little bits like this. I still want to keep things in terms of larger shapes. Where was her hand? Ha <laughs> ha. Her hand was right here. Using just a corner. Just want to remember where that is. And that means if that's her hand there, this tree kind of disappears in some ways. There are parts of the tree that are in light, shadow. Let's look at those feet. Well, let's look at the lower half of the figure. Yeah, it's not bad. I know it looks like it went away, but you can always get it back. Okay, so this. All right, I'm not far from starting to mixing up blocks of color. Not far at all. Again, I just want to indicate that there's a mass of leaves here, which then forces the eye back into this inverted triangle that I find very compelling. And I'll have to make sure that the tree, the sky holes in the foliage up here don't compete with this area. And let's see, I'm trying to decide, is there any corrections I want to make at this point? Let's see. Let's see now. Now, I mean introducing, because this lead white is different than titanium white. It doesn't get as cold or chalky as quickly. I'm introducing a little more white earlier. I'm looking at this shape against this shape here. And you know, to be honest, this would be bigger, the, the skirt would be bigger, and which would require her to move, basically pick up the figures and move them over. I don't care enough to do that. So we're gonna let that stay what it is for now. And put that in. that in, that in, and that is essentially our composition. So at this point I want to sort of critique it in my mind for relative, you know, scale. You know, how big is Adelaide against Lulu Bell? Um, do I have the elbows and hands close to where they should be? That sort of thing. Essentially, can I continue to whittle away or chip at what doesn't look like the painting? Let's see, that would be there. So that basket's a little lower. Okay, so now we're going to take a break and I'm going to lay out the full palette so I can start to mix the mid tone colors. So the palette is now set up to reflect all, all the colors that we're going to use for the rest of the painting. We won't use the same amount of everything, obviously. Um, we'll probably rely more on the earth colors than, say, the primaries. But it is set up in a certain logic. And it's basically a spectral palette, meaning it's like the rainbow. Starting here, as we move through the primaries and the secondaries, all the way to here, which is Viridian. So we have, again, Cad, uh, Cad Yellow Lemon, 
cadmium yellow, cad orange, naphthol red, quinacridone red. Um, this is the violet, which I mentioned is not on his palette, but he would have been mixing his uh, uh, rose matter with his ultramarine to get something close to that. This is the ultramarine. This is the Prussian blue. This is cerulean blue, and it's real cerulean blue. It's not the cerulean blue hue. It's the real stuff. So it doesn't have quite the punch that uh, modern cerulean blue hue has. And this is viridian, which would be substituting for the emerald green that he might also use. This is the modern version of Indian yellow, which would be a lot higher in tinting strength than the actual stuff he would have been using. This is yellow ochre, raw um, sienna, burnt sienna, raw umber, burnt umber, and then finally that green terre verte, which is basically a greenish earth color. The reason why we're going to use most of the, the, the earth colors is because A, that's what he did, and B, because they're mineral pigments and they're granulating in such a way that's more close, closely related to how his paint moved around, especially when you add the, uh, the actual painting medium that we're using. I'm going to put more of that down because we're going to go through a fair amount of this pretty quickly. All right. Now what's interesting is the Letharge, the lead oil combination in this paint medium and the addition of these, this range of earth pigments, we're going to see this painting dry uh, within 12 hours. Once I stop painting, it'll probably be dry within 8 to 12 hours to the touch. And that's actually to our advantage because many, many, many paintings by Sargent end up being multi-session paintings, often over months, if not years. And we're going to do something within three, maybe four days. So I don't mind it drying quicker. So I can talk about some of those effects that he could get. What we have here is, looks like a mess, but it's kind of a road map, but it's not a road map that I have to, to take as, as I've laid it out. I can change things. Because of this medium, and the uh, solvent, and I'm going to start to actually get, I'm going to go back in and redraw things, but I'm going to sort of kind of look, I'm squinting, I'm looking, I'm squinting, and I'm thinking, where do I want to start? And I think I'm going to start with a sort of a, a, a very thin passage of Adelaide's head and neck. And we'll make that start with a version, I'm, I guess you're just going to have to guess at what I'm mixing here, because I can't talk about that and paint at the same time. But the idea here is to get close approximations of the value and the uh, sort of hues of what I want. Now, that's probably a little darker than it should be. I'm going to add a little more white in there. And I'm going to just look for something that's close. It doesn't have to be spot on. It just has to be close at this point. Because there's going to be many layers built up when it's all said and done. And you can see that the canvas is giving under the pressure and weight of my stroke. I need to be careful not to push too hard at some point. And I'm just thinking of the shape. I'm not even necessarily trying to stay within the lines. There are times like in the back of her neck, I'm, I want to come outside and correct where that neck is. And I'm letting that paint underneath become part of that correction. And I'm thinking, well, let's look at, yeah, by the way, nothing you see in this session here is going to be what you would see at the end of the painting. It's all going to be covered up. That's important to consider. This is the finding the generalized shape and form. So it's going to look kind of flat for a while. This, this is direct painting, which is what he was known for. But it's in layers, <laughs> if that's not an oxymoronic. Um, I want the direct solution, but I also want to make sure that my underpainting is, is sort of set up for the overpainting that happens at some, some point later.
Now, kind of a strong color here, but Okay, let's see. Now let's look at Lulu Bell's little pinafore, which I see is kind of a off, sort of very sort of subtle but light blue. And we're going to kind of put green blues in, bluish reddish blues in, in it over time. But again, we just want to be close at this point. And we're going to keep things fast and furious. Now, one thing I should be doing at this point, I think, is should is the operative word, is looking for uh, longer poles. You know, I don't want that to constrain me too much. Always looking for the long pole. But as the painting develops, I do want to sort of see if I can make longer, more descriptive calligraphic poles. Boy, right there, that helps right there. So we start to see some warm and cool differentiation. Right now, I want to go back to, let's say, the basket. And again, just trying to get an approximation. I know from experience that I'll be able to layer on top of that all sorts of sort of variations of that color, that mass color of the basket. And so now we're starting to see right away how Adelaide has a white shirt. It's kind of the lightest light in that part of the painting because we have tinted the basket. Now let's continue, let's continue down. I want to actually establish maybe the overall gray quality of the skirt and then come back up into this area. We'll also start laying in sort of greenish casts in the, in the foliage so that uh, we again have a sense of the hue that should be in that area. Um, but before we do that, this is an easy thing to mix, but I didn't put down any black. It said that the first time Sargent was asked to paint with Monet, and Sargent thought Monet was the only impressionist of note. Um, we'll go into that later, maybe. But it said that when he first set up to paint and he looked at Monet's palette, he cried out, how do you paint without black? And I don't remember the actual quote in its entirety, but it, it had to do with the fact that Sargent felt he couldn't paint without black. Um, wasn't that interesting, was it? Other than to know that he did paint with black. I'm gonna make the sort of neutral gray out of those two and then I can take and push that in all sorts of directions warmer cooler redder greener bluer in this case I'm going to go a little more towards the purple um, purple meaning towards the violet and again now I could mix with a knife this into the color and create some very creamy beautiful Pay things to push around, but we're doing this quickly. Now that might be a little too purple, but that gets us in the ballpark, doesn't it? And again, I'm looking to paint or lay down the middle value, the mid-tones, as he would have called it. I don't use that word myself, tone, uh, but I am for this video. Uh, mostly because so many people get confused by what do you mean by tone? Are you talking about the value? Are you talking about tonality, meaning how the painting is keyed? Are you talking about a musical term? I've always found it a little confusing. But in the case of Sargent, tone, I think, equates with value. OK. 
thing. And again, just trying to keep things loose. I don't want to get too edgy, so to speak, at this point. You want to save where you put edges till later. I'm not even sure I want to get into a lot of modeling of the light. That's interesting. I was going to go elsewhere on this, but I feel that it's probably better to set the overall shadow mass that Lulabelle's pinafore is in. That means changing it, the temperature from this burnt uh, umber to something cooler and a little grayer. And that's easy to do. When you use neutral tertiary colors, such as the umbers or the siennas, um, I guess that was a sienna. Um, no, I take it back. It was an umber. You're able to sort of shift the, the temperature or the color of that around. So we're going to take a little of that. And actually, I'm going to recycle some of that purple. I don't think I'm going to, I'm going to have to put some other colors into it. This is where you pick up paint and you borrow it from other piles to make a neutral, let's say. Now that's nowhere near where I want to be, but to get there just takes pushing it in that direction. Now I'd say that's in the, t in the sort of hue range I want it to be, but it's still a little intense and it might be a little more red. Eh, it's not bad. I think what we're going to do is just cheat. Cheat in the sense of I'm going to just take that shortcut and then we're going to lay this in and see where we are. At this point, you don't see me dipping my brush to clean it because everything's happening in sort of the same value range or very similar value ranges. It's only when I start getting into, let's say, the whites of the shirt or the lights of the dress or the skin tones where I'm really going to start cleaning out my brush and worrying about the purity of the color I'm mixing. Scumbling, just to keep the paint loose. And remembering to keep a lighter touch at times. And then that starts to connect this shadow that's in on her pinafore with the light that's on her pinafore. And perhaps I can even be a little more aggressive. Now that's a lot of paint. I'll end up knifing or wiping that down. And it's also gone a little purple. So seeing that this is wet into wet, and that's the, one of the beauties of this medium, is you can do that. You can just push paint right into it and it will sort of mix on the canvas. Sargent did a lot of that mixing on the canvas. He did a lot of pre-mixing, but he also understood how to make a third color from two colors pushed into each other. Now, I want to be careful again not to get too caught up with contours or borders at this point, because those will sort of constrict me and keep me, or at least de-incentify me, from making changes to the drawing that needs to happen. That need to happen. Uh, having said that, I just need to remember we're just getting approximations here at this point, and we don't have to go for the finished surface. Let's say. I think that that's probably a little dark and a little purpley. So let's just push more, yeah, more of the lead. Again, like that. There's a little shadow there that rounds out our shoulder, cast shadow. And then of course we have this area here which goes into shadow on her shoulder. Like that. This shadow, this arm is higher than this side. And that's enough for right now in that area. So I'm going to start to carve a little bit out using this Terra Vert. Terra Vert is a color I used to paint with a lot 20 years ago. 
because it does some interesting things when you glaze with it. I've never really used it much as a, a body color or a stroke, you know, color. But let's see what it does. But what I like is that it does cause this beautiful striation that sort of captures uh, a sense of motion. Okay. And again, the whole point here is just to kind of lock in. I think I'm making a mental note that the anatomy of her forearms a little funky. The distance from her elbow and the apple is not what it should be. But I also have to remember that it's foreshortened and that as I start to develop form, you know, I will round out the foreshortening and make it a little more clear. All right, continuing on. A lot of people ask me, you know, what order should you do a painting in? I don't know. I mean, whatever works, honestly. Um, I don't think there's a particular sequence I always undergo. Um, I'm also, I'm always pushing and pulling, scraping, working certain areas. And so I look for, let's say the, I look for the things that seem to need the most attention. Okay, so I'm gonna be bouncing around a fair amount here on this painting as it starts to develop or continues to develop. Um, I am trying to stay reasonably true to Sargent's ideal of painting your midtones first or establishing your midtones first. Now what you see me doing here with the rag is I'm not just swirling this in the odorless mineral spirits and then going to paint. I'm actually trying to get any loose paint or any loose mineral spirits out of the brush. And that's why I use cotton rags. They're much more absorptive than paper towels, and in the end, they're even less expensive when you buy them in bulk packs, either from the store, art store, or from better yet, paint stores will sell them to you very cheaply. And you'll probably find that you use less of these than, say, rolls of paper towels. I do. But when I'm jumping back and forth, um, I like to have this in my hand. It's one of the things that has probably made the most difference in my painting, um, for the most part. Now I'm gonna just do some big sort of shapes with the green. I've never tried using this paint this way. So we're both gonna see something happen here. Yeah, see there's not a lot of tinting strength there. It doesn't really go very green. It might have been better off for, for me to have started with this on the gray-white of the, of the uh, painting. But in for a penny, in for a pound. I know I can take that burnt umber that's already down there and shift it very easily. So I'm going to be a little more aggressive. I'm going to take some of that. And I'm going to take some of this, which is a very aggressive, very strongly tinted color. And I'm actually going to go opaque on some of it. And that you can see, if you look at that mix, how yellow that went and how much chroma bumped went up on that. Um, that's kind of what I was after. So I kind of turned a fairly transparent earth green into a yellow more opaque green. And I'm not even necessarily going to paint out in the peripheries. I'm more in interested in making the transition at this point from the figures into the foliage. Trust me when I say I can knock the foliage out pretty darn quickly. It's those transitions that matter. All right, and again, in the spirit of, of um, not getting too locked up in detail, uh, well, you see, that's the thing I'm gonna be looking for right there. Not yet, but that sort of like wet drag into wet drag where you overstrike the edges. If you look at Sargent's paintings, you'll find that he's often pushing his shapes 
out into an area larger than they should normally occupy, and then he's cutting back in over with more paint. And that's how he seems to create some of these fantastic transitions that you couldn't possibly render out by stroke, 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 stroke. But look at that. We'll be, we'll be working towards that as the painting progresses. And there's another thing is I've noticed in some of his paintings he would do this where he doesn't really pick up the brush. He doesn't go stroke, stroke, stroke. He's doing this and there's always contact in the brush with the surface, which also again lends a whole different um, quality to the mark. And then as the painting develops, he might be giving you more of a longer pull. So right there, that's kind of where I wanted it to go. I wanted that to feel a little more greener or more green. I'm not worried about lights and darks. I'm just worried about sort of overall um, middle value hues. So let's do some more of that elsewhere and then move on. Now I'm going to try this with the Viridian. This is the color I'm much more familiar with. Now Viridian has a blue cast. This has a yellow cast. I want to go towards the yellow, so I'm going to add a yellowish hue, but I'm not going to add those because they're so pure. I'm actually going to put in the ochre, which is going to substitute the white. It's going to push it towards the yellow, green, and it's already opaque, and it's lighter than the Viridian, so I'm going to end up with a color that's pretty darn close. But if you were to look at it, you'd see there's more opacity here. Let's see what happens if I add some of the um, medium. Yeah, it gets closer, but it's still more opaque. Let's see how it looks over here. You know, it's still a little too, well, it's not too bad. I'm not going to worry about it. I was going to say it was a little too bluish. Now, I don't mind, in fact, I want some of the umber to be showing through, both sort of uncovered by the green and also through the transparent of the green. I want some of that because that's one of the things that's going to tie it together, meaning tie the colors together, sort of a unifying uh, value and hue. Now I'm going to thin this down. I don't normally want to thin my paints down, but up here I do want to keep the painting thin. I want the thicker impasto parts to be more towards the center, to where the story, the narrative, the relationship that I want to depict exists. Now, I'm not trying to smooth out the surface. I'm just trying to randomize and sort of make it less active between light and darks up there so that our eyes, again, are drawn to the center. And a lot of these strokes, you won't really see, I think, towards the end after I put other paint on elsewhere. Remember, the sky holes will come in at some point, and that will start to make these strokes look less varied, less intense. So I step back so I can get an overall effect, see it. Um, the idea being here that um, I like to have people view my work from about five, six feet, especially at a painting this size, maybe even as many as uh, seven or eight feet. One thing that's nice is that when I step back like this out of the frame, I can actually see my reference, my subject, and my painting all at once. And I can start to see things that have to be modified or corrected. Um, when you paint like this, it's really hard to kind of get a sense of, is this the right size of the face? Is this too big, too small? Is this in the right place? Because you just can't make that mental jump. But if you're like this, way back here, you can actually see what has to change. And boy, there's some things that have to change. Hey, would you like to win a beautiful painting worth almost $3,000? We've got a beautiful Joe McGurl plein air study that he's done of the sunset in Maine. It's gorgeous. 
If you want to have an opportunity to win it, go to paintinggiveaway.com. Just put in your email. That's all you've got to do, and you only need to enter once. We'll be giving away the prize at the end of May. Go to paintinggiveaway.com. John Singer Sargent, a great master painter whose name is synonymous with stylish portraiture and elegant figures in various environments. His paintings have inspired and influenced artists for a century and a half. Artists everywhere have been on a quest for his secrets, methods, and materials ever since. This video is unique from other demonstrations, I think in its length and the detail that I will go into. Thomas Jefferson Kitts is exactly the modern master to bring Sargent's brilliant insight to your work. In this video, he shows you why Sargent was Sargent. My plan is to show you the things that we do know that Sargent did, the materials he worked with, and also offer some fairly informed speculation on things that we don't know about, but we can see in the work that he produced. Thomas spent decades studying every aspect of methods, techniques, and materials Sargent used to create his masterpieces. Shape and surface planes, value, meaning light and dark, color, meaning hue and chroma, lost and found edges, thick and thin, opaque and transparent. All of these terms have to do with the quality of the paint and the value relationships that he's establishing. You'll find out what exciting paint colors Sargent used, how his canvases were prepared, and his preferences for brush types and sizes. He lived in a special time in art history when the Impressionists were clashing with the academics. He borrowed the spontaneity of the Impressionists, but never abandoned the disciplines of good drawing, although mostly with energetic, direct brush painting. You have to be brave. You really have to be brave about this. You can't, you can't just sort of sneak up if you want the strokes to convey a sort of, you know, convey a sense of activity and action. With this video, Sargent Techniques of a Master, you can clearly benefit from both the mastery of John Singer Sargent and the modern master Thomas Jefferson Kitts. Get ready to be enlightened. Available on DVD or digital to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order your copy today. That was Sargent, Techniques of a Master with Thomas Jefferson Kitts. And you can learn more about that at lilyartvideo.com. Now let's get to know Thomas a little bit. A lot of people ask me, when did I start to paint? And I, there's two answers. The, the first answer is I've always painted. There's no time in my life when I don't remember painting, drawing, or something. It just from the earliest days. But I think in terms of how I paint now, that comes from the undergraduate degree that I got at the Kansas City Art Institute. I was lucky enough to get into a studio, this is back in 1984, and I was lucky enough to get into the studio of a man who insisted that his students draw and paint from life, which was not very common at that time. Uh, and I think that really set me on my path 35 years later. I'm also asked, you know, what do I like to paint? Um, and, or what is my ideal subject? And honestly, it, the subject is like the second thing in my mind. The first thing is, do I want to paint something? Um, it's not like I decide I want to paint boats, boats this morning and then in the afternoon switch over to painting people. I like to paint it all. In fact, it kind of drives my galleries crazy sometimes when I walk in with a painting that doesn't really relate to the work that I've given them in the past. But, eh, you know, I just like to paint. When people ask me to describe my painting style, I sometimes don't know how to answer that. Uh, I'm a bit of an ADHD person when it comes to painting. I have a lot of art history and I have a lot of influences and it's almost whatever I'm thinking about at that time. But if I had to put it in a sort of a simple, simple, uh, Soundbite, I'd say, I like to combine aspects of realism 
and Impressionism and find ways to blend them together, mostly because the heroes that I venerate, the art heroes, so uh, they do something similar. While I'm widely known for my landscape painting, specifically the en plein air or on the spot, uh, on location work I do, uh, I, I've actually been trained with the figure dating all the way back to the early days in the 80s and I've enjoyed putting figures into my landscapes. I just haven't done much of them in the last 15 years. I'm returning back to working figures into my landscapes because I'd like to share that aspect of what I do with my collectors and with the world who's interested in what I do. Another thing I'm often asked is where do I get my inspiration? Um, not so much in subject matter or you know environment or something, but in terms of who do I look to for, um, well, inspiration, there it is. I have always made it a point to look at artists of the past as opposed to contemporaries, mostly because I want to see the work that stood the test of time. So commonly I would say, you know, well, let's say obviously Sergeant Soroya Zorn, but if we go past deeper into history, it, it, you, you, you start to come up with people like uh, Franz Halls or people like Velasquez. Um, and even the Impressionists, um, it's all good. It really is. Um, I can almost, I can find almost something of merit from almost any painter of any period that I want to extract and somehow understand better. Color is everything to me. I think it was my entrance into painting. Um, when I went away to school, I thought I actually might be color deficient because I couldn't see the colors that other people talked about and what was really going on is that I wasn't understanding what I was seeing. When I ended up in school and had color classes, suddenly I started seeing things that I didn't recognize before and it wasn't that the hardware changed, it wasn't that my eyes were different, it was I was taught about color and what it is and what it does and how to use it so that then everything I look at has color, I understand it. One of my favorite quotes, one of my favorite quotes is by Cezanne. And he goes something like, he says, I apply color until I achieve a likeness. And that has been a credo for me for the last three decades. Another quote I like having to do with color has to do with uh, William Merritt Chase. And he said, uh, get the color right and the eye will do the rest. And I found that to be pretty true as well. If I just nail the color, be it realistically or be it sort of interpretive or expressionistic color, if I nail the color, People really see the subject. Along with color is the fact that I love playing with the paint, with the brushes. Uh, to me, one of the things that still separates painting from, say, digital computers and imagery is the fact that it's a physical thing. Paint is real. It pushes around, it lifts, it sticks, it scrapes, it does all these things, it has a dimension. You know, it used to be that we used oil paint to kind of create the illusion of space into the picture, as if you were looking through a glass window onto a world, and that you wanted to remove any sort of, uh, how should I put it, surface to that window so that there's nothing impeding you to see through that window to whatever was on the other side. The window being, of course, a metaphor. But since modernism and today, we actually actually try to make the viewer aware that they're looking at a surface. They're looking through paint to the subject, let's say, but the idea here is that I'm not trying to hide that I'm painting any more than, I don't know, somebody's trying to hide that they're singing. I have been asked, uh, you know, do I paint anything else? And yeah, mediums all over the map. I was trained as an illustrator, so I can certainly find my way around gouache, casein, acrylic, watercolor, pastel, and oil. I've concentrated on oils because I think of oils as being the sort of the grand piano of all instruments. Everything can come back to the piano and be expressed. Whereas if I go into, uh, I don't know, a casein, you can do some wonderful things that are beautiful, but there are certain things you can't do with casein, and that same is true for pretty much any other medium. However, having said that, I have lately been going back to painting in watercolor, partly for the challenge and partly because, well, 
it's just a beautiful media, and I want to see if I can actually learn to control it. Um, one of my favorite quotes by John Singer Sargent about watercolor, when he was asked what did he think of his watercolors, he responded, well, it's making the best of an emergency. And there is that aspect to doing a watercolor that is not in oil. I can take my time, I can slow down, I can be more leisurely with an oil. With a watercolor, you just have to go lickety-splick. I came to teaching honestly, or as honestly as one can. Uh, I started teaching 10 to 12 years after graduating myself and spending time out there painting, drawing, and moving around in the real world. Uh, I was actually asked to put together a, an art department for a BFA program, which I did and ran for 10 years. So I had this wonderful opportunity handed to me to both design curriculum, staff the school, and work with students for three to four years at a time. I left all that back in the, that was 2000 actually, 2000 I decided to leave that and just go back to painting full time and started teaching smaller groups, workshops, a uh, few weeks at most, and it was a different thing. But I have to tell you, I keep coming back to teaching because there's just nothing more pleasant, nothing that makes me feel better than working with somebody and suddenly seeing the light bulb go on and you know they got it. This is something that they may have been struggling with for a long time or they tried to come to it from a different place. But boom, it clicks and they just, they just get it and you, everyone's happy, everyone's happy. When I'm working with students, and I do work with students almost all the time, either on trips or workshops or locally, uh, even online actually, whenever I'm working with students, um, I have this attitude of, I will work as hard as you do. And they know that. So if they're gonna work really hard, so am I. If I sense they're not really putting the time in, we're gonna talk about that um, and see if she, wa she or he wants to continue. Uh, honestly, in terms of inspiring people that I'm working with, it comes down to picking out the really good stuff that we can build on and sharing that with them. Also putting just, you know, challenges just outside of their reach so that they just have to stretch a little further, not to the point where it's intimidating, but to the point where they know they have to reach for it and when they do, because they almost always do get it, uh, they know that I'm going to set the goal a little further, a little further, and they're going to at some point realize, oh, wow, I'm doing stuff I hadn't done before. This is great. I've been at this for almost 35 years now, and sometimes people ask me, well, you've been at it a while, so how, you, how do you stay inspired? And I guess... The answer is pretty simple. One of the reasons why I paint from life is because it's always new. I just can't run out of ideas. I can't run out of subjects. All I have to do is get up and walk across the street. In some cases, all I have to do is turn around, and it's a whole new painting. Sometimes all a model has to do is turn around, and it's a whole new painting, uh, if you look at it that way. Uh, but I will admit, there are, there are times when I wake up and I'm lying in bed and I'm thinking, Ugh, I don't really want to paint today. And that's the time I actually do get out of bed. I eat my breakfast, I do my ablutions, and I go to the studio and I start painting. I may not feel so inspired to do so, but once I start, once I pick up that brush, start mixing color, throwing it down on the canvas, the inspiration comes. I think one of the most important things, anybody who aspires to, a, I guess, a professional level or at least a sort of a, you know, a, a really high level painting is that inspiration is for amateurs. You don't sit around waiting for it to happen, waiting for it to find you. You just get going and start painting.
That was Thomas Jefferson Kitts and Sargent, The Techniques of a Master. You can learn more about that at lilyartvideo.com. Thanks for watching today and keep practicing. I'm Eric Rhodes. John Singer Sargent, a great master painter whose name is synonymous with stylish portraiture and elegant figures in various environments. His paintings have inspired and influenced artists for a century and a half. Artists everywhere have been on a quest for his secrets, methods, and materials ever since. This video is unique from other demonstrations, I think in its length and the detail that I will go into. Thomas Jefferson Kitts is exactly the modern master to bring Sargent's brilliant insight to your work. In this video, he shows you why Sargent was Sargent. My plan is to show you the things that we do know that Sargent did, the materials he worked with, and also offer some fairly informed speculation on things that we don't know about, but we can see in the work that he produced. Thomas spent decades studying every aspect of methods, techniques, and materials Sargent used to create his masterpieces. Shape and surface planes, value, meaning light and dark, color, meaning hue and chroma, lost and found edges, thick and thin, opaque and transparent. All of these terms have to do with the quality of the paint and the value relationships that he's establishing. You'll find out what exciting paint colors Sargent used, how his canvases were prepared, and his preferences for brush types and sizes. He lived in a special time in art history when the Impressionists were clashing with the academics. He borrowed the spontaneity of the Impressionists, but never abandoned the disciplines of good drawing, although mostly with energetic, direct brush painting. You have to be brave. You really have to be brave about this. You can't, you can't just sort of sneak up if you want the strokes to convey a sort of, you know, convey a sense of activity and action. With this video, Sargent Techniques of a Master, you can clearly benefit from both the mastery of John Singer Sargent and the modern master Thomas Jefferson Kitts. Get ready to be enlightened. Available on DVD or digital to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order your copy today.